Perfect. All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm Jackie. I'm one of the UCLA ASDA Pre-Dental Outreach Committee co-chairs, along with my lovely co-chair, Ethan, who's here with us as well. And we are so excited to have four UCLA dental students joining us today, um, Michael, Melanie, Michelle, and Alyssa. And they're going to talk about their pre-dental journey, their experience here at UCLA, and the dental school experience in general. Um, they've taken time out of their busy days to join us, so we are so, so excited to have their perspective of the school and their journey thus far. How today's going to work is that we are going to just have some general questions. Oh, wait, not yet. Um, the students are going to introduce themselves, talk about why UCLA, briefly about their background. We'll go through a couple prepped questions, and then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end. And... Without further ado, we'll start with Michael. All right. Hey, everyone. My name is Michael Alchik. I am originally from San Diego. Uh, I went to UCSD for my undergrad. I uh, majored in human biology, and my minor was in human development science. Um, I have two cats. These are Gloria and Tiago. And, um, uh, I like to do or um, skiing, going on hikes, going to the beach and traveling. Um, uh, the reasons I, some of the reasons I chose UCLA or the main ones at least, um, location. Um, we have like the prime location here. The weather is great all the time in LA. I can go on hikes, I can go skiing, I can go to the beach, I can do all the stuff that I like. Um, the cost of attendance is very, um, very good here compared to other school or at least competitive schools in California. Um, the reputation and connections that we have just graduating from UCLA, the name itself can open different doors from working opportunities to like specializing or doing any residencies. Um, uh, UCLA has also all the specialty programs. So in case if you're interested in doing any residencies or specializing in anything, we have everything here and you get the, the chance to um, go to the clinics and see if you like the actual specialty or not. So yeah, these are uh, some of the reasons that I chose UCLA for. Hi, my name is Melanie Robles. I'm a D2. I went to UC Santa Barbara for my undergrad and my major was biology and my minor was in Russian. Um, I chose UCLA because I'm from California, so it's close enough to home and I wanted to spend time in like a big city because I don't think I'll ever like live in one. Um, like long term and then I also chose UCLA because it seems like it had uh, everything here like I came into dental school with an open mind um, and it has like I think 13 specialties here and it has like research if you want to do that so I just want to keep all the doors open for me and of course the cost is low um, I did a row in college so I put that picture in um, and I put I was looking through my phone and I found like a bunch of funny pictures of my cat. So I thought I'd just throw them in here. And then um, in my free time, uh, I, meet, I have a wife and she, we're long distance. So we usually just like meet somewhere. Like, so we're in Zion and then we went to Maryland over Halloween weekend. So, yeah. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, my name is Michelle Long. Um, I went to UCLA for undergrad and I majored in biology and minored in Scandinavian studies. Um, and so the reason why I chose UCLA, obviously some of these we mentioned before, but one, the number one reason is actually the cost of attendance. Obviously it's very affordable, but um, it's a reputable school. Um, as soon as you say UCLA, um, it doesn't matter if you're on the West Coast or the East Coast, like people will automatically know it. and there's a lot of weight that's associated with UCLA. Um, uh, and then third is the location. I'm from SoCal. I really enjoy SoCal weather. And so along with that, I wanted to be in a dental school where I could start to build those connections in the area where I wanted to eventually practice. Um, and so having gone to UCLA also as an undergrad, um, I had people that I knew around the area already that I brought in as patients. And so that already laid like a very solid foundation for me here at UCLA. And so it was just kind of logical for me to kind of keep that ball rolling and to continue here at UCLA and then eventually live here in SoCal. 
Um, and so fun fact is I have eight congenitally missing adult teeth and four retained baby teeth. So yeah. <laughs> Okay, hi everyone. My name's Alyssa Nolan. Also, I sincerely apologize for my weird lighting. Um, I am teaching a Zumba class right after this finishes, so I had to quickly drive um, over to the gym where I'm teaching. Um, so anyway, I went to Chapman University in Orange County, so um, being at UCLA was nice. I didn't have to travel too far, but I'm originally from the Bay Area up north in California. Um, I studied uh, biology, I think I may have said that, as well as leadership studies. And then I just want to add my future plans because I feel like that'll probably be important for any kind of feedback I have about UCLA and my um, intended like, future. So um, I won't be doing a GPR or AEGD residency in pursuing general dentistry. Um, those are not required. They're just additional years of training you can do. Um, but initially when I entered UCLA, I wanted to do ortho. Then I switched to PEDS and then I thought I wanted to do GPR. But then now my plan is just to um, work at a community clinic. Um, and then why I chose uh, UCLA was definitely the cost. You know, I ended up getting a, a pretty good scholarship, which I can talk about later. Um, but at the time of selecting, I didn't know I was going to get a scholarship. So costs really mattered to me. Um, also, kind of like people said, the UCLA name really means a lot. Um, you get exceptional faculty and tremendous experience and really all the specialties. Um, so it definitely sets you up well to specialize, um, as well as just like to all the opportunities you have being at UCLA and all the mentorship from faculty, kind of like Michelle was saying, um, if you want to stay in the Southern California area, you already have a great network established. Um, and then also, I just love Southern California. So I didn't really want to leave if I didn't have to. All right, first question we'll go through is what does a typical day look like for you? Um, I guess we'll go in the uh, same order for this question, Michael. Um, so for me, that kind of depends on the day, but usually um, we, since we have, since in COVID now, we only have to do the labs in person. So we just um, go to the lab, um, go back home, Kind of study, uh, go to lectures online and watch a pre recorded lecture. And um, yeah, usually it's from eight to five, our, our schedules are. We don't have classes all the time, but um, it's during that period, I guess, during the day. Um, so yeah, it'll be like more like studying and then doing our own studying after classes. And then you still have some time to like go to the gym or do whatever you want to do. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. Okay, so for D2s, we usually have labs like, or we have clinic time from one to five. So we have pretty much the rest of the day to either like watch lectures because they're all recorded, uh, work out, whatever. And then, yeah, after lab, we just study more. <laughs> the days go by really fast. <laughs> So for D3, things kind of change from preclinical to clinical. So in D3 year, we're very, we started to get very heavily into like mainly clinicals. We have currently like one or two days that are like partly didactic. And so a typical day for me will be like do some lectures on Zoom um, and then go to clinic. Um, so clinic time can be from like uh, nine to 12 or two to five or both. And then so right now I'm taking, as I'm in my third year, so I'm studying for um, integrated boards right now. And so after a long day of clinic, I still come back and study for boards a little bit um, and then go to sleep and get ready for the next day. So that's a little bit of what my day looks like. Other times I'll be in lab preparing for like patient cases and doing some extracurriculars. So being a D4, my schedule is like pretty similar to Michelle's being a D3. I'd say that just the biggest difference is typically D4s have um, a larger patient load and are maybe doing like more restorative or endo kind of appointments, but that's not at all to say that you're limited in any year. It really just depends on your patient pool and your needs and just your level of comfort, um, your D3 year and what you're willing to take on. But 
if I'm being completely candid, I will wake up at literally the last second I possibly need to wake up at and then, you know, do a mad dash to clinic so that I can set up for my appointment. Um, so usually we account like an extra hour um, before you start the appointment to set everything up. Um, I don't know if other schools have people that set stuff up for them. That would be really nice. <laughs> UCLA does not. Um, but you really get to know all your materials and things like that. So set up, see my patient um, for the appointment. Being a D4, I try to get as much done as possible at every appointment. So I'll do a cleaning and then a couple fillings, take two impressions. Um, I really try to maximize the time. And then we always have an hour lunch break from 12 to one. And right now, again, kind of because of COVID things are different, but if this were a couple of years ago, there were always events going on during lunch, like whether it's some club putting on an event, um, a lunch and learn, I, I must have been to like over a hundred lunch and learns during my whole dental school career, um, which is just faculty or guests coming to talk about a variety of things. Um, so that's always a really interesting way to kind of supplement your learning um, or just learn like new interesting things, whether it has to do directly with dentistry or not. We've had all kinds of speakers come. Um, and then typically an afternoon appointment or if I don't have an afternoon appointment, kind of like Michelle said, I might be doing lab work, whether that's dentures, doing a wax up for a patient getting, you know, aesthetic veneers or something done. Um, or I might be writing contact notes, hunting down faculty for signatures, um, all kinds of things. But definitely the day is easily filled with, with school stuff. But I'd say the nice thing about D3 and D4 year is when you go home, you kind of get to go home. Um, I mean, again, depending on your comfort level with procedures, sometimes I still might be looking up what the best, you know, cement is to do with a certain kind of crown, but um, it's kind of nice to go home and be able to leave things kind of at the office, if you will. Um, I might still have to call some patients in the evening or send them texts. I usually prefer to text all my patients if they try to tell me I didn't remind them up about an appointment. I'm like, no, I did. Look, just scroll up. Um, so that's a nice thing. And, and I can't remember who said but like, yeah, you'll still have time to go to the gym. Uh, like I really advocate that you make time to do other things, keep in contact with friends, family, whatever's important to you. Um, so yeah, usually that's what my evening will look like, like go to the gym, you know, cook if I have the energy, um, you know, little, little things to find joy in the day. <laughs> All right. Our next question is, how do you manage a work-life balance? We can swap up the order too. It doesn't have to necessarily be the same for every time. It's up to you for. Okay. So I will just say like, I, I think now that like we're all adults, you'll just find there's no such thing as work-life balance. It's just doing what's the most important to you. Um, and I don't mean that in a pessimistic way, like at all. I mean that truly in that you only get done like the most important things in your day, right? So you know you'll have to get certain school things done, right? You know, you're, you have to eat, you have to sleep eventually. So um, those things will happen. And I think whatever's most important to you, just like remember that and remember what makes you feel your best. Like I know I've had times where I thought, oh, I have to call this person or hang out with this person or be involved in this club. Um, but if it's not really serving you, if it's not, you know, guiding you in the direction of your future, um, if hanging out with those people, you know, doesn't rejuvenate you, like, is that really that important? And that's something I've just learned now that I'm a fourth year. Um, and so I think like my answer to finding work-life balance is just what is like the most helpful to me and making sure I do that. So like for me, it's working out um, most days, like not every day. Um, and then just making sure I stay on top of my school stuff. Because if I don't stay on top of my school stuff, I can't be a nice person to like the other people in my life that I care about. You know what I mean? Um, and then I will say it took me until my fourth year to realize that sleep is important. Um, so I've definitely gotten a lot better at that. Um, Oh my gosh, sorry. Someone was just yelling <laughs> right behind me. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, I think you're going to go into dental school, whatever life you're currently living, whether you're taking a gap year, you're coming out of college, um, and you're going to think that you're going to maintain a lot of things from your life. But 
it's going to be an adjustment no matter what. And so I think making sure I hold on to the things that make me, that allow me to be the best provider of care, um, you know, and I mean that both in that I'm like staying up to date on my school stuff, but also I'm staying up to date on the things that make me happy and make me feel, you know, the most mentally sound. So. Yeah, I agree with that too, um, greatly, uh, especially like the priority thing. Um, a lot of it is work. Um, maybe like I'll reserve like one day at night, like a Friday night to just like relax. But yeah, you definitely have to prioritize work, the things that you need to do. Um, but I think honestly, having support systems outside of dental school is the best way to kind of get away from the stress of dental school. I really value the friends that I have outside. And um, sometimes you just need to take yourself away from that environment and bring yourself back to reality and remember that there is life outside of this. Um, and so that's kind of how I stay more mentally sound. Another thing about sleep, yeah, I didn't realize how important sleep was and like until my third year when I'm like unable to interact with the patient coherently and I'm like, okay, maybe sleep is like kind of important. Um, but yeah, second year, I just, I didn't really sleep that much, but third year, it's really important. Um, so yeah, just keeping those things in mind. Um, it will be like more work than life, but you'll find a way to figure out what exactly you need to do to remain more like mentally sound. Um, so the way I manage a work ba life balance is uh, I plan basically like when I get the syllabus, like I just like plan out my whole planner and then I like figure out dates. I want to like go see my wife or go see friends at the town or go see family. And I also like, I don't know if I'm doing dental school wrong, but like I need a lot of sleep. I sleep at least eight hours every day and like that's not a good you don't with your friends or hang out with your peers or whatever like stuff you want to do and it's very important to do stuff outside of the dental school like don't be just involved in the dental school or whatever school you go to um it's going to be too much and you just want to kind of have like a breather outside of this the, the same environment i think it'll just make you feel better and you'll be more mentally healthy i guess um, sorry, if I can say one more thing that I just thought of, um, just with everyone like describing their work-life balance, like it reminded me of this, everyone's definition of work-life balance also looks different. So don't let someone make you feel like yours is wrong and don't necessarily think that theirs is right. Um, because for example, like I enjoy working out for someone else that might stress them out to try to like always fit that into their schedule. You know, also like I don't want TV, but my friends like love to do that to unwind, but I would never tell them like, what are you doing watching TV? You know, just try to like really be in tune with yourself. Like when you're first starting off and like what your needs are and just kind of fill out your day accordingly to that. Um, and it might take some adjusting too, because like in college I was su super sociable and not that dental school made me a total recluse, but I just found that having that alone time was like one of the best things for me. Um, so just be aware of that, you know, don't let, I mean, honestly, as a whole, like don't let what other people are doing, make you think that what you're doing is wrong. Like if they're spending hours and hours in sim lab, you know, that doesn't mean that the time you're spending is not enough or anything like that. So really just like follow your gut, listen to your body and, you know, live your life as you think it, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be like corny or like on my soapbox, soapbox of any of this, but, um, just kind of like follow what it feels is best for you in school as a whole. Yes, love that. All right, what are some challenges that you face in your current year of school? 
I can start. So um, the challenges I find right now is like, there's just not enough time in the day to do everything. So you kind of have to like prioritize and just, I don't know, learn to like be okay with like, just not getting everything done that you wanted to do. Um, and as long as you're like trying your best, honestly, it's fine. Like you're going to pass. It's going to be fine. Um, and then another challenge I'm recently having is like not really knowing how to interact with patients. I worked at a dental office and I got the hang of it, uh, but I was assistant. And now I feel like as like the student doctor, I'm supposed to know like what I'm doing and like be in charge and like professional and like I don't know I just feel like I'm like being an imposter so I feel really awkward um and I also like I'm learning how to like do these things on a person <laughs> so it's like very nerve-wracking but I think you just have to like, like keep doing it and it'll feel natural or that's what I'm telling myself <laughs> I would say yeah just keep on <laughs> keep on doing it and it'll get easier um, and watching upperclassmen, like just watch them talk, but like multiple because your style might be different. Um, as a fourth year, my challenges, I feel like are very different because like I've gotten over a lot of like the road bumps you typically um, get through in dental school. It's just a matter of, I guess, learning patient management, but in a different way, like making sure patients show up like I'm very lucky most of my patients show up to their appointments, but sometimes there's like financial costs that keep them from continuing with like a treatment plan or that just delay things. Or um, I guess now that I'm older or like getting older too, I'm handling harder cases. So I kind of have to prep patients like, hey, you might have some soreness after that. Or, you know, I see something not like scary on their radiographs, but like, ooh, they're going to need a root canal, you know, and explaining that just kind of getting better and better at like giving those prognoses. Um, but I think the biggest thing is just fulfilling your graduation requirements. That's kind of the stress everyone has um, because it's kind of, a, there's like a lot of different requirements to keep track of and they're all very specific. And so that's kind of like the challenge for us. And like I said, just making sure my patients that have the requirements that they're coming in, that I'm able to complete their treatment um, in a timely fashion, because there's a lot of things like I can't make someone's denture until I finish all their crowns and things like that. So just making sure everything is planned out well and that my patients, you know, have money, which is like out of my control um, and stuff like that. And I guess that's kind of the hard part. Your fourth year you'll find um, is some things are just like out of your control. You never know when an appointment day, you think it's going to be an easy filling. Next thing you know, it turns into a root canal. So just being pre prepared for those kinds of things. Yeah, um, to build off of that, everything she said is completely relatable and completely true. Um, for me, third year is like a really big transition from preclinical to clinical. And so you're like thrown in and you have to learn like the software, the lab forms and everything. And you have to figure out how clinic actually works. Um, and like you just ask a bunch of questions basically um, to upperclassmen, to faculty. And like sometimes it's like a little scary because you're like, oh man, I don't know it. I wonder if he's going to think I'm dumb if I ask this question, but you just got to ask it anyway. Um, another thing is like throughout dental school, one thing that you will always learn is like patient management. Like you may have learned something uh, like today you learn how to tell them that they need a cleaning, but then tomorrow you might be learning to tell them that, oh, they need to get a tooth extracted. And for some patients, it's like a very emotional process. And um, like, it's just something that you're consistently going to never really be super comfortable with, but it's something that you need to learn how to do and you need to learn how to navigate those really difficult situations. And so um, these are some of the challenges that I'm facing. Um, another thing is like, I'm actually going into clinic now with like much lower expectations in terms of like timeline, just because you think you're going to go in um, to get a crown done. And then you find out like, oh, wait, he needs the root canal first. And then, oh, wait, he needs like to build up the tooth because there's, there's not enough tooth structure left. And then like things go wrong. And so things are going a lot slower. And so that my challenge is just wrapping my head around the fact that I won't get things done at the pace that I want. It's going to go as fast as it needs to go. And um, life's just going to 
throw you for a loop sometimes and you just got to navigate around it. That's dental school, that's life, so yeah. Um, I think for me as a, like a first year, the challenge that I faced at the beginning was just to transition into having like so much um, information from lectures. Um, we think at undergrad, oh, we had a lot of like information, the slides are too much, but it's nothing compared to dental school. <laughs> Um, some classes are easy, some classes are hard. Uh, so just navigating through it and getting into the flow of how dental school works was probably a challenge for me. Another one was just figuring out, because once you walk in, there's literally like a, probably a hundred club that you can join, um, different specialty programs, um, different advocacy programs. There's a lot of stuff, like really good stuff. And you feel like you wanna be participating in all of them, but you can. So just figuring out which ones I want to go to was also a little bit challenging at the beginning. But honestly, after like being here for two months, I feel like everything is kind of falling into place. I, I'm i starting to figure out what I like. I The things that I thought I liked, I didn't like. So it's definitely a learning process. And I feel like even with upcoming years, it will probably, I'll get more, um, I guess, ideas about the things that I like and things I don't like and the clubs that I wanna join. So, yeah. All right, so our next question is, what would you do differently in previous years of dental school? Well, I guess, Michael, you, you haven't had any previous years, but um, for the others, what would you do differently? Well, I have a lot of previous years. Um, oh, Jackie, were you going to say something? Yeah, it can be pre-dental years too, just in general as throughout your journey, but you can go ahead, Alyssa. Um, that's a, okay. I'm actually glad you mentioned what I would do differently in pre-dental years. Um, I just like, I mean, I'm assuming all of you are shadowing. Like I had over a hundred hours. Um, I thought I like you know, knew my stuff, but I did not. I think it's so easy because you feel like you don't really know anything when you're um, there, you know, like shadowing, but really, really try to ask questions and learn everything you can and actually look at what they're doing. That is how I really had realized like I got nothing out of shadowing because I like only knew what a couple instruments were. And just like the way we prepare teeth, like doing preps, when we learned, I'm like, I couldn't believe it. Like, I couldn't believe that dentists did the stuff that like, I was learning in school. And that just showed me, like, I, I really didn't get that much out of my time shadowing. So um, that would be like, I guess my pre-dental tip. And then for my first year tip, everyone will say this, I think like no matter what school you go to, but don't get behind. And what I mean by that is like, you don't have, like, even if you don't go through a whole PowerPoint in one day, just building the habit of doing something like to review will go such a long way. Um, also side note, there's a book called Atomic Habits, best book I've ever read in my entire life. I think it would be a remarkable book to read before dental school. Um, and it's a really easy read. I promise. I know you're probably like, no more reading, but it's a good one. I promise. Um, so just like doing that to not get behind my second year, I would just try to make sure I really learned like the different clinical procedures, like as they're reviewed in classes and even started to keep like a little cheat sheet of this is what you use for this type of like crown, like the cement, kind of like I was talking about earlier, and then just assisting as much as I could. And then my third year. I still assisted a bunch, but I almost wish I did even more because it just makes you feel that much more comfortable when you go into clinics so that technically nothing is your first time seeing anything because yeah, you practice everything on a mannequin, but a human is very different from a mannequin because there's blood and saliva and a tongue and, you know, pain sensitivity. And, you know, they have parking that's like running low and they need to go pick up someone from soccer and things like that. So it's a very different experience in clinic. So just giving yourselves more and more experiences, you're almost like, this is what I would kind of do when I would assist, like pretend I was the practitioner. Um, so it almost kind of felt like I vicariously did the procedure, even though obviously I didn't. So really just staying organized, building good habits, and then just giving yourself as much exposure and experience as possible within reason. Of course, you know, don't exhaust yourself.
Mm, I guess, uh, yeah, definitely assisting. There's no, like, you can't under assist. I feel like you should always try to assist. Mm -hmm. um, another thing is like when I was in preclinicals, I think because I was so overwhelmed with like the didactic coursework, a lot of times what I did was just like, I wrote, memorized everything um, without necessarily understanding why we do things. Um, and so that's something that I think would have been, it would have laid a better foundation for me to build knowledge off of. Um, and unfortunately, like, I think I was very caught up in just like trying to pass or um, like just trying to do well that I didn't really think about why. Um, and I think that just stemmed from like a lack of foresight, maybe um, sense of panic, maybe. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I think that was something that I feel like I wish I did differently. And yeah, I think, yeah, that's all I have for now. <laughs> My um, things I wish I did differently is kind of similar to Michelle's in that like, I wish that I didn't spend like all of D1 just like trying to check off boxes off my to-do list <laughs> and instead like took the time to like watch the lecture and like really like understand and like watch it again if I didn't like because instead like I'm like I know I've seen everything again this year but like I feel like I'm just relearning it um and like kind of to like go with that is like I wish like I just was more present, like even like in the lab and stuff, like talk to faculty and like practice more, even if you get it checked off, like attend more Zoom lectures, even though you don't like have to tour you. Like, I feel like I just wish I would have been like more present than just trying to check off boxes. Yeah, really quick, uh, building off of that, like don't rush in lab, like lab time is your time to learn everything because the next time you do it, it's going to be on a real patient. Um, and so if you just like, if you think like, oh, I'm just going to like do this temporary really quick and not put my hundred percent into it, that's how it's going to be in clinic. Um, and so I would say like, really take that time in lab to learn and talk to faculty and get as many tips and tricks as you can before clinic comes around. Yeah, being friends with faculty, or I mean, you don't have to be friends, but finding faculty to be your mentors is so, so huge. Like, I think that is one thing that I took upon myself that not very many of my classmates did, or they might have in the preclinical lab, but they didn't exactly sustain those relationships. Um, because at least at UCLA, and I can't imagine other other schools are any different like these faculty are here because they want to teach and they love teaching you know if they're if they wanted to make money they wouldn't be teaching you know so they're choosing to do this so just remember that like they really want to help you and and help you grow and be a good dentist and so um yeah like I can't stress that enough and then what like one thing I want to add to what Michelle said about like preclinical lab um is yeah like don't rush but also you want to go for quality not quantity because you can go through a zillion teeth um the little like plastic teeth and they're expensive so I would just say practice intentionally and really learn to self-critique and self-evaluate because that's how you really get better and when you're in clinic and you know, you're looking at your prep and you're realizing like, oh, this doesn't really look like how I want. Knowing how to fix that is the most important thing. Um, so yeah, just a couple of things I want to add. Um, I think for me as a D1, so I didn't, obviously don't have a lot of experience still in dental school, but um, I think for pre dents and a piece of advice would be uh, not to just focus mainly on your grades. It's not just about that. The admission is not just your grades or your DATs. Yeah, it's a huge factor, absolutely. But try, as um, the rest said, um, get more exposure to the, the dental work. Like I, personally, I didn't have any research experience, but I have tons of like shadowing and I shadowed different specialties. So I think that made my application better. So don't focus on like having just one thing that will you know, like your grades or your DATs or, oh, I need to have this, I need to have this, you know, just kind of like trying to cover as much as you can, see if you actually enjoy dentistry before you get involved in it. Um, yeah, so as much shadowing, as much uh, getting exposure to the actual field, I think is definitely can go a long way for you.
I think this is my slide. I'm forgetting, <laughs> forgetting which one, if Ethan did it or I did it, but I'll do All this good. one. <laughs> um, what is your favorite thing about UCLA and what is one thing that you would change about the program? I can start with that. Um, I think for me, the best thing or my favorite thing at UCLA so far is I love the fact that we have a pass, no pass system. Uh, I think it's great because all of us get to share our notes and kind of builds like some sense of community. Like we all sit together, share um, flashcards that we did or notes that somebody took or a study guide. Um, I know it gets really competitive at other dental schools because they have their rankings and they have their GPAs and stuff like that. Here, it's just, you have to get a 70% and then pass and you're good. Um, so this is like definitely like the best thing about, for me at least my favorite thing so far. One thing that I would change about the program, I would probably have more for at least for the D1s for us to have more exposure to like drilling and like hand skills more because we only have um, a, a lab called waxing and where we kind of get exposed to like dental anatomy and stuff like that. But um, having more exposure to like maybe like direct restorations and stuff like that drilling or using the hand piece more at the beginning, I think would be better. Don't worry, the drilling's coming. <laughs> like I think you have like one month and then you start. Um, so I would say, and I guess it's like hard because I mean, I'm just thinking about it in terms of my D4 year, um, but I love the faculty. Like, yeah, your earlier years, some of the tests are so wildly hard. Like you can't believe that they would think you could remember that much information at once. Um, but like they said, everyone passes like somehow. Um, but like, I am so, so grateful for the faculty um, I have in clinic. I feel like I have such great mentorship that they know so much. I mean, they're like our faculty at UCLA are like world renowned. Like they're known so well, like they are the ones teaching major CE courses. So I love that. I feel like it's a really, really great education that I'm getting. Um, that being said, one of the downsides of UCLA, and I feel like this is a pretty well-known thing, is unfortunately our patient pool isn't the biggest, so our clinical experiences are limited. And it, well, it's more so like very dependent on like the patient pool that you have. Um, you know, we're in Westwood, which honestly is like another thing I like about UCLA. We're in a very nice area. There's so much to do. Um, but that being said, there's not a ton of people needing subsidized dental care. Um, so. I guess like that's one thing because I want to pursue general dentistry it would be nice to have like more of my days filled with like crazier kind of restorations um but I still feel like I've gotten a good amount of practice and one thing that they say is no matter where you graduate from you're a good dentist but not a great one and that just really develops with time and experience so um yeah, so would be nice to have more, but I still feel like pretty good about my my skills. Um, so my favorite thing about UCLA is also um, uh, in clinic is the faculty. Uh, the, there's some faculty that's just like amazing. Um, on the flip side of the argument is that because there is so much fac so many faculty members. Sometimes our patients don't get like a consistent continuity of care. And with dentists, there's like this saying, like if you ask 10 different dentists, you'll get like 10 different opinions. And that's still true in clinic and it's true everywhere in any, any dental school. And so sometimes like it is a little difficult when you have something planned for a patient, but then so another faculty member that you schedule with doesn't agree with that and you have to suddenly like change the treatment plan and so you have to explain that to the patient too as well if like treatment plans do change and so it does add to another layer of complexity to patient management and to like treatments um, and so that's just it's not necessarily something that I have a solution to or that I can like enact changes to because obviously faculty is very important but um it's an issue that's everywhere in dental and dental schools everywhere um and so that's just one thing that I feel like is a little difficult especially when you're like running around trying to get like consultations from different dental faculty members 
sometimes you aren't sure because you just are hearing so many opinions, but that's just, um, that's just like a byproduct of our profession, really. Um, so, so like uh, Michael's is pass fail, <laughs> especially like for like practicals, you can even like not pass the practical and then just retake it and pass the class. Um, that's really nice. A lot less stressful. Everyone's like a lot happier, I think. Uh, and then for the one thing I would change about the program is like kind of just the clinic in general, <laughs> like the I don't have a particular problem with like a lack of patience right now. Um, but I know like some of my classmates are already like they're the older, like the D3 and D4s in their, um, in their groupers, like aren't caught up with their cleaning. So they don't get cleanings yet. Like it's already like, they're already kind of behind. Um, so I just feel like it's kind of like the instructions in clinic are kind of like unorganized. Like you kind of just like figuring it out. But on the flip side of that, what's good is that like everyone, all the students are like so nice. Like I, when I did my first cleaning, I was like very lost, but I just like grabbed anyone that I saw and I was like, hey, like, how do you find this in the, um, the computer? Or like, what do I, what am I doing here? Like, what do I use? And like, everyone is just like, we'll just stop what they're doing and just help you. <laughs> even faculty that don't even really understand, like they'll, they'll help you or like, they'll try to find a student to help you. Like everyone is just trying to help each other, like figure it out in clinic. <laughs> So that's like really nice. It makes everything less stressful. All right, next is what is one piece of advice you would give to other pre-dental students? Um, I can kind of, I kind of mentioned it before, but the one piece of advice is um, Again, like trying to get as much exposure as you can to the field, like see if you like the dentistry itself. Um, don't get focused on just, you know, that I want to get the best grades and I want to do just the best, get the best score at the DAT. There's so much goes into the application itself. It's not just that. Um, and yeah, I get more like life experience. Um, people, I mean, I guess the admission, I guess uh, the faculty would love that to see it in your application. It separates you from other students. And I think that's, yeah, my advice for pre-dental. Um, my advice for pre-dental students is, um, like I know you're doing a lot. Um, you're like obviously working your hardest. You're doing everything you can. And I think you should just trust that and like try not to stress because um, like, how do I say this? Like. I didn't have great grades, but like I did what I loved and I worked my hardest and like, I didn't think I was getting anywhere, but like, so I applied to a lot of schools and I didn't get interviews at like the lower schools that I thought would like, I like qualified for. And then like, I got into schools I didn't even think I had a chance with, for example, UCLA. And I just think that if you're trying your hardest and like you have a passion for dentistry, like the person in your application will see that. And like, just try not to stress too much. Like you can't do anything except try your hardest. And um, also, I think it's important to know, like, everything you're doing while you're in school, like, why you're doing it. Um, find out, like, who your mentors are and uh, always talk about, like, what you've learned from everything that you're doing and always relate it to dentistry. I think that's, like, really important because like, a lot of things I did, like, were not really dentistry at all. Like, I was an athlete. Like, I studied Russian. Like, I was a tutor. And, like, I just, like, related all <laughs> to dentistry and, like, talked about, like, what I learned and, like, why I was doing the things I did. So um, I wouldn't – I think this, if you can explain yourself and, like, you're working your hardest, like, don't stress. Like, yeah. Um, I would say, like, in your – pre-dental journey, uh, the people who helped me the most were actually people who are already in dental school. And so I think it is important to kind of talk to your peers and get a very honest opinion of what dental school is and what to expect. Um, I would say talk to professionals that have recently graduated, um, really try to get super hands-on experience so that you know what you're getting into and you don't get into dental school and be like completely sideswiped by what you're learning and be like, I didn't sign up 
<laughs> because you did. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, yeah, I think just talking to people, um, especially if you don't have any connections to this healthcare field um, is a really important, powerful tool. Like you sometimes, even if you don't know someone, it just takes you, you have to like put yourself out there a little bit and ask questions. And that's cool, kind of what I did. I didn't have anyone in this field. I actually didn't even decide on dentistry until like halfway through my undergrad. Um, but I really hustled and like I asked people and I reached out to people um and because of them because of like their help and their like grace I was able to apply on time and not have to take a gap year and so I think the people around you can really help so um and then you'll do um other people the same favor and you'll help them too and it's just a cycle of kindness and giving so yeah okay so I have like two separate kind of um advice like advices I would give I guess like one is like for applying and then the other is like once you get into dental school um and I've had like some people send me questions on the side so I'm gonna try to hold just make sure schools will recognize it if like you write something your personal statement and then the person you are is like very different remember your personal statement is how they can meet you without meeting you so make sure your personality and your passion your values all that like comes to life um as a whole uh and then one thing at least for UCLA that they really emphasize is they want to accept leaders and they mean that in a variety of ways so like leaders in academia like leaders in their community you know in all those different respects so when they get an application they're looking for someone who they like I guess the best way to describe it is going to make them proud as like having as an alum like you know you're going to be someone super involved in CDA or the ADA or something like that or maybe you are going to end up teaching CE courses um they're kind of looking for I guess like standouts in that way but at the same time okay I'm, I know I'm going to sound annoying because I'm going to sound like I'm saying you have to have it all, but that's like not the case, but they want someone who's like well-rounded, but overall, I would just say like passionate about something almost where they can anticipate the direction you're going to go. Like for me, my application, I'm sure like made a lot of sense because I was super, super involved in a lot of like clubs. I was super involved in clubs at UCLA and I very much intend to be a part of like various organized dentistry. That's what we call like ASDA, um, which is the student chapter of the ADA. So that's kind of my tip. Um, and then I think just if there's ways to establish a connection with any school, so not just UCLA, like talking to their ASDA like, reps for any events they're going to have. Um, I think you can reach out to the admissions office, though, be wary of that. Um, I would just reach out to schools you're interested in and see if there's any like events or opportunities like they know you want to get into dental school and if you're reaching out they know you want to go to their program so don't be like too annoying honestly um because I know that hurts people too sometimes so those are kind of like my tips for applying um and like this sucks like it, it's hard applying to dental school is hard it's you know studying for the DAT it's not gonna be fun but it's temporary so just like give it your all, like just try to give yourself as much experience as possible because you do want to make sure dentistry is really something you're interested in. Otherwise it's going to make your tough days even tougher if, you know, like the end in sight doesn't feel worth it to you. So then my um, piece of it, pieces of advice I have for you once you're actually in dental school, kind of like I was alluding to earlier, make sure you have an outlet. Um, you can't be doing dentistry all day, every day. So whether it's working out, painting, um, playing piano, like video games, whatever it is, like make sure you have something that helps you kind of feel like you again. Um, and that just like brings you joy, very important. And then the other thing is like, promise me you will stay in touch with friends, not in dental school because, you know, dental school is four years. Like there is an end. And unfortunately, once it stops, everyone won't just be waiting, you know, for you. So it's, you have to still maintain your friendships, maintain, you know, connections with people that are important to you. Um, but I think at the same time, it's important to kind of give them a heads up, like, Hey, I'm starting this huge transition. I don't know how it's going to be. So like, 
if you can just be patient with me during some of the times, like I'm really going to appreciate it. Like if you can check in on me from time to time, that will mean a lot. Um, and just kind of like do check-ins with yourself too, because I know I had like a couple friends where the transition was like hard for our friendship and like, thankfully we resolved it. Um, but I'm hoping to share that kind of foresight with all of, with all of you. Um, and yeah, work hard, but care for yourself because again, there is, you know, time after the four years. So you don't want to be burnt out before you even get started too. All right. So Wait, I'm so sorry. Someone else sent me a question. Um, and so I just want to answer that about the DAT. So a study schedule for that really just depends on what kind of study or you are and if you're doing like a Kaplan course or not. Um, for me, I was working in order to pay for a Kaplan course, which kind of like I think almost worked against me because I had to work more to pay for the Kaplan course. That makes sense. So then I just kind of had less study time as a whole. Um, so I think just know what kind of study you are. I don't think the Kaplan course is mandatory. I think the DOT bootcamp resources out there are really great. You can just buy an old book if you want an exhaustive amount of material to go over. Um, but just doing a lot of practice tests is really helpful. And um, this person asked about mindset. The best mindset to have is that you're only taking it once. And that is the best mindset to have for all your board exams too. You know, like don't even give yourself the option of taking it again for me, like financially, I was like, I can't afford to pay 400 and however many dollars, like again, to take this test. So that enough was like a deterrent for me, like one and done. Um, and so I think that's like a really great mindset to have. Um, and then, yeah, like, I, I think I forgot how awful studying for the DAT was, but I remember it was really, really bad. I remember it, like having a breakdown one time at the dinner table. Um, but one thing I would do is like give myself little rewards at the end of the day. Like I took it over the summer and the bachelorette was like going on. So I always had that to look forward to or um, like going to the gym, like at the end of the day, things like that. Um, but I'm not going to lie. Like it's not fun because there's so much information on that test, but you can do it. But repetition, repetition, repetition is the biggest thing. And that's the same for dental school. Um, don't spend too much time on studying one thing because it won't stick. You're going to have to repeat it over and over to make it click. So I hope that answers that question. Does anyone have any specific questions for our panelists? Oh, we have a raised hand, go ahead. Hi, I have a question. Um, since it's almost the final time for us and I might fail class and I'm just wondering if I do fail that class and retake it again, how does it look like for admission office? Because it will replace my previous grade, but it will show up on my transcript and my overall GPA would be the GPA after I retake it. But I heard for professional school, they will look, still look at my previous GPA before I retake the I class. believe it depends on the school. And that's kind of like the hard part. Like I know my school was not very merciful with retaking classes and whatever the grade was shows up. But then like the new grade shows up, doesn't replace it and they average the grade out GPA wise. So I think, I mean, I think you might like kind of already know the answer to your question. If they see a failed class, like if they take an A, they always like to see an upward trajectory. So let's say, you know, college starting off as a really rough transition for you, um, but you improved over the years, that's going to serve you really well. Um, and so the other thing is within the application, they give you like a little section to, I can't remember what they call it, but kind of like explain anything. So like any failed classes, maybe you had a really rough semester, maybe you had to withdraw from a class. Um, they just give you that space to kind of explain anything that isn't otherwise explained. So you can say, you know, like maybe like something was going on and then that's what led to, um, you know, like different grades compared to the rest of, of your transcript. Or if you decided you wanted to do dentistry late in the game, that would explain why maybe you don't have as many shadowing hours and things like that. Um, so just utilizing those things, but grades are definitely important, but they're not the only thing. So I think 
just try to do your best when you retake it um, so that you can show that you like put that effort in. And like, because it's histology, it's not any prerequisite for down school. It's not necessary. So if I do fail that class, I have to retake it. There is no choice for that, right? <laughs> I would absolutely retake it if you failed. I think like the most important thing is just like to realize like with yourself like why did I fail did I not study enough like did I not reach out to like my professors enough like what like really like learn from that so when you retake it like you can do better because I think the biggest thing in your application is like overcome like overcoming challenges in your life and like I don't know, they want to see that you can like persevere and that you're determined so like honestly like I failed the class like I retook it like I think that like the fact that like I did a lot better the second time was like spoke like was like loud like I think as long as you can learn from your mistakes like I wouldn't like worry too too much about it gotcha. Thank you. yeah it's, and yeah. special considerations you can definitely spin it as something that you were able to overcome and learn from um so it there's always two sides to a story so I think like you can spin it as like you change for the better and knowing that you're going to go into dental school more prepared you're going to apply this to your future in dental school and stuff like that. I think for um, just because I had my application recently, um, I used to remember, I think on my application, there was a question from UCLA that they asked if there was like a class that we failed or like not necessarily a class or something that we didn't like that we'd fail at and explain what happened. Um, so I think that would be a great opportunity for you to, again, like spin it in a way that will actually boost your application. In a way, like, you know, alignment and that you grow and be a better person, then that will help you, you know, with your application and mission. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree with everything that's been said on that topic. Um, Maria, I think you were Hi, next. Thank you for the hands. wonderful presentation and your hearing. My question is about the IDAS curriculum. I know UCLA recently is incorporating more technology. So can you please tell me more about that and your experience with it? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I can talk a little bit about that. Um, so basically, uh, now we're getting some new technology in clinic. We start in, I think, second year preclinicals. Basically, we're using like um, digital scanners in clinic, uh, in preclinical. And then now, recently, we've implemented uh, actually, um, that's like a new technological advancement that we're doing. For prosthodontics, we're also using like digital scanning as well as um, like 3D CBCT imaging to create. Uh, radiograph it's a little complicated like radiographic guides basically and it's all like 3d and we all design it digitally um, uh, and so like the school is taking very large steps to increasing that kind of in technology and making it available to students yeah actually even as a d1 we like uh, we get to scan uh, already have like access to scanners and stuff. So you get very early exposure to brand new the technology. So that's pretty cool. All right, um, Rachel, I think you have the next hand. Yeah, I have um, two questions. So one is, I've been shadowing a general practitioner for like a long period of time, but I also wanted to like um, shadow like a different specialist here and there. But like when I submit my application, I wasn't sure how to like lay that out. For example, like with one GP, because I have a lot of hours with her, it's like fine. But with like other people, like it'd be like smaller set of hours, but with different, like let's say three different specialists. Um, is that okay to like 
put on the application or should I like try to clump it into one? I'm not sure like what the best like way to do it. But yeah. Um, that because I shattered very different specialists. I shattered like endo and ortho and oral surgery and all of that. And I was advised to lay everything out, like just tell them every single hour that you shadowed, just put it out there and give specific, or I guess like some sort of description of what you did and what procedures you saw. Um, that will definitely make you stand out more than just lumping it all into like one, oh, well, I shadowed like different doctors for 200 hours. I would say like, put it in different categories, it will kind of make you look better on their application. Awesome. And then my second quick question is like, I was curious as to like what kind of extracurriculars you guys are part of at UCLA. Um, I'll say also in the chat, and then if any of you have like any more questions for me, feel free to send me an email, but just heads up all, I always say this every time I speak at something, um, I'll probably just schedule a phone call with you over instead of like doing an email because I always have like a thousand things to say. And so a phone call, I think it's just like better for both of us. Um, but I was very, very involved like during my time at UCLA being a fourth year, we kind of like ease back a little bit. Um, but I was a part of the ortho study club. I was their newsletter editor back when I wanted to do ortho. And then when I was interested in peds, I was their like, research chair. So I did a newsletter for that. And then I also coordinated research opportunities for students. And then I was the vice president of the peds club. Um, I also just like, um, you know, the, what this, this like was put on by ASDA. I was the ASDA, like I had various positions, but then um, was one of the, I was the secretary for ASDA. And then now I serve on the district 11 cabinet, which is the governing body for all of the dental schools in California. Um, in addition, like I did PEDS research. Let's see. I don't know. I was a part of so many things. Like I was part of the students for inclusion, um, diversity and equity club. Um, I, I feel like I, I'm, well, actually, I know I'm forgetting like everything I was ever part of. Oh, I was a part of class cabinet. I was part of ASB social. Um, I've been a part of like a thousand things. And I think that's something you'll find at UCLA as students are very, very involved. Um, so it's kind of like the culture to be in a part of various clubs. Um, but whether you want to have a leader or you just kind of want to be a so yeah, so like I said, I'm gonna put my email right now in the chat. So if any of you have additional questions, you can reach out to me as well. Yeah, and regarding leadership positions, it's very common for, it's very common to have leadership positions. Uh, there's like a bunch of different uh, clubs and they all have like cabinet positions. And so most of my class has like at least like one or two, at least one or two uh, leadership positions. Um, for me, I was also really involved in ASDA. Uh, I was like uh, HIV committee co-chair. I was newsletter committee co-chair. Um, I'm in the Chinese Dental Student Association. I'm vice president for that. Uh, I've served for like a number of years on that cabinet. Uh, I'm involved in like hospital dentistry, special patient care. Um, so uh, UCLA has a really like famous hospital dentistry clinic. And so I'm doing research with like the clinic director there uh, for, we have something called basic dental principles, which is basically like a class for pre-dentals, uh, pre-dental students who are looking to go into dentistry. And it's basically like a rundown of introduction, introductory courses, like uh, of dentistry, like anatomy, um, different like lab procedures. Um, and so I'm a TA for that um like the lab portion of that um I was also involved in some like non-UCLA involved things like something called best buddies ambassador speech coach which is basically like I help coach kids with um intellectual and developmental disabilities um so just stuff like that thank you Um, I feel like all my classmates, like they're involved again in like a million ASDA things, like on the, like whatever 
board member and I say for like different clubs and like for me like I know it was like super overwhelmed in undergrad so like I wanted to be very intentional with like the things I wanted to do so um I didn't want to do things just to like say I was doing things so I just um like I'm part of uh, Cupid, which is like the Queer United People in Dentistry, because like that's something super important to me. And like I signed up to be a BDP um, TA because like teaching, I think, is really important as a dentist and like to me personally. And um, what else? Uh, oh, and then like I wanted to do things more related to dentistry. So I signed up for like Ceramic Study Club and like the Gold um, Study Club. So like I'm trying to be like, I don't know, do things that I care about because there's way too much to do at UCLA. You can get involved like way too involved, way too fast, <laughs> which is fine if that's what you want to do, but yeah. Um, for me, so I, when I first started, I was overwhelmed with the amount of clubs that you can join. There's so many things that you can do and be involved in. Um, so I decided to kind of choose the things that I like and go further in them instead of having being involved in so many different clubs. I chose like three that I wanted to focus on and get leadership. Maybe eventually I'm part of my class cabinet, um, which is something that you guys will put on when you get into dental school. Um, I am part of the Indo club because I feel so far I want to do Indo. I don't know if that's going to change or not. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and part of the Middle Eastern club. Um, so yeah, there's different clubs, but you can get to choose and see which one you like. You can experience it. And then if you don't like it, you can just like drop out of it. So yeah, you get a lot of different extracurriculars. Here. All right, you can take the next raised hand. I can go if Rachel doesn't mind, I'm sorry. So it's funny, I think it was Michelle who, mentioned something about the BDP. It's funny because I literally just got an email today and I like registered for it and wanted to know if, you know, that's something you guys recommend as a pre-dent or if it's too much. Um, no, yeah. So I actually did BDP as a pre-dental student as well. I think it was one of like the most like amazing opportunities that you can have as a pre-dental student. If you have the opportunity, I would definitely recommend it because um, not only does it give you like a little bit taste of what we do didactically, honestly, the lab portion that you get to do is uh, really, really valuable because it's stuff that we start to do as dental students in our first year. And if you're able to experience that, then um, so basic dental principles is BDP is basic dental principles. It's a kind of like a two part course that's offered here at UCLA, but um, students from outside UCLA can also sign up too. Um, basically, it gives you like an introductory course, either didactically, there's a didactic portion, and then there's a lab portion. Um, and so it just gives you like a more of a very personal um, on insight to the dental career. And um, so for the didactic, some topics are like tooth abnormalities, uh, tooth anatomy, uh, preps, what it prep looks like, um, aspects of a prep. And then the lab portion is like, you actually get to make like stone casts, um, like models of teeth. Uh, you get to actually start drilling as well. Um, and so it's just like a really valuable experience. I would definitely recommend it. Will the class, or I think there's, yeah, you said there's two parts to it. I think I read the first part is gonna be online. Is the second part I'm assuming hopefully in person? Right, yeah. So first part will be uh, over Zoom just because it's all didactics. You're just learning through lectures. But then the second part is uh, gonna be in person. And so you actually have dental students who will be like your TAs and you'll have like one-on-one -on -one guidance basically of like how to drill, how to make these like stone casts and things like that. Okay, and then I have another follow-up question. Do you guys offer any summer programs? I saw something you guys offered, but I think it, you guys stopped having it. Um, is it like a volunteer program or? No, it was like a six or eight week summer extensive pre-dent program. Oh, I'm not sure about that actually. No, I think I think you guys stopped it like right before COVID happened. 
Oh, I personally haven't heard of it. I don't know if anyone else has heard of it. No. Um, I asked before my year when I applied, but um, they didn't have any programs. I'm not sure now, but for me, because COVID was so recent, they said they stopped all the programs. I'm not sure if they reinstated them. That might be a good question. If you want to like call the admission or send them an email, they might help you with that. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I will say there is like a volunteer program though um, that you can do at the dental school. It's called like the UCLA Dental Clinic Volunteer Program or something. You do like 80 hours and then you get like a certificate saying that you completed it. Um, it's just like you're like a, a shadowing basically the dental students. Okay, I will definitely look into that. Yeah, you can but look it, into that. Um, is it good to like do, I guess, programs or shadowing volunteering at different schools and not your own I think it doesn't hurt to uh at least you can expand your repertoire and say like you've um experienced different things all right thank you guys so much for answering all my all my questions Um, Maria, did you have another question? I do. Um, my question is about, um, do you suggest giving dental schools like an update on your activities or any hours like post interview and prior to decision day? Thank you. Yeah, I think uh, you. it's definitely better, especially if you still haven't gotten your decision yet. Um, yeah, if it's something that you can, it allows you to update on the application, do it. If it's going to help you, absolutely, for sure. Okay, and the next raised hand. Yeah, I have a question relate to, actually kind of relate to my previous question, but um, I kind of want to take a gap semester or something, but I might extend my undergrad in some way, or I can finish sooner, but without finish, for example, some microbiome or some more difficult bio classes. Do you guys recommend to extend my undergrad time or directly finish undergrad as soon as I can and then probably get a post back program. Which one would be would be better for application? I feel like that depends on like, I don't know, just what you want to do with post back would probably be very expensive. Um, but if you like, if you need it, like if you have not done like well, or there's no upward trend in your whole undergrad, like maybe that's what you need. I know for me, I took, um, I took, let me think, I don't know how many quarters it was, maybe one or two, I took time off. And because uh, I wasn't done grad like with my requirements and um, I couldn't afford to like be at the school um, because like because something weird with my units like I didn't get financial aid anymore so I had to come back home I and during that time though like I think there was a portion on the application that says like if you took time off of school explain what you did and during that time I worked so I could afford to go back to school I took my DAT I shadowed and um, so I don't think there was any like issues with that gap and um because my like um gpa was lower um i really like banked on and i couldn't afford to do post back i didn't want to spend like a whole year or two doing post back I, like banked on like devoting my entire self to my dat and doing really well in it um so i think if you think that that is like a good option for you i would do that because it's cheaper and it's faster <laughs> Thank you. All righty. Any last minute questions before we wrap up our time? If not, that's totally fine. If you guys have further questions, you can email us or um, send us a DM on our Instagram. Thank super, super appreciative for all our guest panelists and uh, for sharing their experiences and their insight. Super helpful just to see each year um, and what, what's in store at UCLA. So hopefully you guys learned a lot and uh, that it was uh, helpful for you.
Yeah, thank you to our panelists. I'm so appreciative of your time. I know you guys have busy schedules and thank you to everyone who joined us. Yeah, that's our email and our Instagram if you have any lingering questions that come up later on. Yeah, you all are free to go. Take care, have a good night. Hey, bye guys, bye Jackie, bye Ethan. Thanks so much for uh, hosting this. Yeah, thanks for coming. Thank you for having us.